um, clusters in trajectory data today. So in my first lecture, I had this um, kind of examples of trajectory analysis tasks. Um, and if we look at these first two, they are related to, to similarity. But in particular, the second one is, is more of a, a question of detecting clusters. So uh, the question here is, what is a typical route? So here, for instance, I'd, I'd like to find maybe this part here, which is used by many of these birds. And that is a question of detecting clusters. Um, uh, a different kind of more global perspective is that we actually want to want, might want to do clustering on the trajectory. So really group, take all of the trajectories and group them based on the similarity. So let me just kind of show you a few examples of where we are, uh, li would like to, or where we are using these methods. Um, if I have trajectory data, this is now uh, of cars, um, we might want to reconstruct the underlying network. And at least for us, the first step that we're using there is first to find uh, clusters or bundles, we call them, of similar trajectories. And they can often correspond to, to roads and where these clusters then split, corresponds to, co uh, to intersections and so on. So that is a, here uh, the, the question of detecting clusters is useful. Another application that <coughs> we looked into uh, is this pigeon data here. So these are pigeons with, with a GPS. Um, they live here and they like to be here. But uh, <coughs> researchers decide that pigeons should fly. So they, are, release, uh, they release them uh, here over and over again. And then the pigeon starts <coughs> to kind of figure out where it should be going, maybe recognizes something here, flies that direction, then sees, ah, home is down there, goes down. And then, OK, pigeon is home, rested. It has to go again here. And it, while doing that, the pigeon will learn more about how to actually get home fast, as we also learn in case we don't uh, use our mobile phone to navigate. But maybe you should say that in Germany, this is a very popular recreational activity to have pigeons and let them fly and have races and this kind of stuff. <laughs> 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 yes. So I indeed, you don't do this here. I don't know. <laughs> I also don't do that. And I, I think these guys also only did it for research. <laughs> but you see that um, that uh, different pigeons actually kind of decided on different routes. Uh, you can also see, or that was actually kind of what we wanted to look at in the analysis, that eventually there's some kind of convergence towards a kind of last path, which it then always takes. Uh, but all of these questions uh, are questions that, that where you can use a clustering analysis and do clustering first, and then based on that, try to, to learn more about your pigeons or whatever your favorite bird is <laughs> or moving object. Good. So, so th those are the two things I want to talk about today, detecting clusters first and then the clustering. And here, just uh, two more examples of where detecting clustering would make sense. You might want to find commuting path or migration routes. Here, there's yet another example, a football example. So this is something Joachim Gutmundsen um, uh, works on a lot and therefore also I can take his nice pictures. So here that is more a question. Here you even are, are, are given, given some kind of uh, additional curve and you, you want to find the corresponding, whether the, you want to find a corresponding cluster in that data. Good. So, so schematically speaking, this is, this is the setup that we have. So in particular, this question of detecting clusters it's also an interesting question on, on, uh, in the case where you only have one uh, trajectory. So this could be our trajectory. And now this path is essentially taken twice by, by that trajectory. And we would like to detect that. Um, so the way we formalize this is, OK, by now you know me. We use the Fichet distance. Um, here we looked at 
pairwise uh, distance. So we wanted that within a cluster, um, every uh, each pair of trajectories should be close. And we'll see more about that later because eventually we, we, we switch to a different version because this one is too difficult. Then, um, if we're detecting clustering, we, do, we do not want to kind of reuse the same part in the same cluster several times. And, um, okay, this is, you can formulate as a multi-parameter uh, optimization problem. And typically, we want to maximize the length of the cluster. And this length, uh, you have to be careful to define it appropriately. So length for us um, will typically be simply that there should be at least one of the trajectories in that cluster that has, or we want to maximize uh, the length of the longest trajectory in the cluster, let's say like that. As, as I said, we have now a multi-parameter um, optimization problem. So we're looking for a cluster with um, at least m subtrajectories of length L and the Fouché distance should be below some value D. And in terms of results, and I want to discuss both of them today, since, since Martin or today also did NP hardness proof, I wanted to top that, so I will show you too. <laughs> um, tomorrow we will ah. oh <laughs> I still have to update my slides for tomorrow. <laughs> So deciding whether such a cluster exists uh, is NP-hard. It's uh, actually hard to approximate uh, below a certain value, below, uh, below 2. Uh, but uh, two approximation we can compute in polynomial time. So I would like to start with NP-hardness proof. And the reduction is from uh, max clique. So we have given a graph. And the question, is there a clique of a certain size? So in this example, so a clique, for a clique, I want to have all of the vertices um, pairwise connected. Here I have a clique of size 4. Yeah, so for, if I would be asking for a case 4 here, I would find that clique. So now in terms of how, how, how do we now model this using or encode this using trajectories. So we, we look at the problem of clustering k trajectories and the length will actually be um, n. So if I have a clique like this, I will essentially um, have, have one set um, of points for to encode the uh, adjacencies of A, one code for B, uh, one point for B, or one set of points for B, C, and so on. And the encoding that we have here is the following, and this is not yet trajectories, but just points and distances. Um, I have A here. Everything that is adjacent to A sits here, and everything that is not adjacent to A sits down here. And the idea being that we'll have a trajectory um, that if I, I will have a trajectory that encodes A, and it will do the following. Um, since this is a set of points that encode A, it will go through this A point here. So, and then it will go simply through the points, um, either through the middle point if it is adjacent to that vertex, so for here, this encodes B, and A is adjacent to B, so here it goes through the middle, and um, here too, here too. And then for E, E is not adjacent to A, so here I'm encoding E, and here my trajectory goes down. And I do that for, for each of, I will have a trajectory for each of the vertices in the graph, so for B, it will go through B, and for instance, when I'm encoding D and its adjacencies, it will go down here. C, C and D and E. So that, those are my trajectories. And the, now my distance threshold that I will take 
will be essentially this distance. And what that means is, um, if I have a trajectory, so if you think of my first trajectory that went through A and then down here, um, if I want to include that trajectory into a cluster, then I'm, I'm only able to include traje trajectories in my cluster that either also go through A, so there's no other one going through A, or it goes through B, C, or D, because those just have kind of distance that is small enough. But um, E here, if I have a trajectory that goes through E down here, I cannot include it in a cluster with a trajectory that goes through A. If I do not want to include A in my cluster, um, I will be able to include everything else. So yes. Yeah, I will go back to D. Uh, hopefully, yeah. there's no mistake. Yeah, no, 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 just, uh, <laughs> that, that bend in the middle. I don't know what is that bend. Between D and DE. At the bottom, you still have D and then DE, but there is a bend in the middle. There's a bend in the middle. Um, it goes up and then comes back. Uh, I think yeah. that's what is that. Peak between. Yeah, yeah I, I, I see the peak. Yeah. And I'm now trying to think about why, why there's this peak. Is there some geometry why there has to be this peak? D. I'm also right now, I'm not sure why I placed it there. Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is also a somewhat schematic representation and not, not, not quite the geometry. But um, that is a good question. <laughs> so this would be close enough. This would be close enough, but A and E is not close enough. And that in particular means, if I think of, of, of a mapping, so if I want to include A, this would be the cluster would have to kind of move like, like this, which in particular means that if I want to include A, I, or let's say this, this would be now a cluster that includes A, B, C, not D, and not E. And what we see now is, so, so that in corresponds to this clique here. And there is, so if there's a clique of size M, so if this is a clique here, then it, I can include A, B, and C in a cluster, simply because for the A curve, the B curve, so A is up here, here, and otherwise, um, a is in the middle except for E, for E, but for E, I mean B and C will also be um, either in the middle or down here, and so on. So there, there is this cluster if and only if there's a clique. So that means that it's as hard as max clique, and that in particular now also means that if I think about uh, approximation, I can see since since this distance is twice as far, so I would have to increase the size of the disk by a factor of two to also, for instance, include E. So as long as I change the radii slightly, um, I can still encode the problem, and that in particular then also means that um, up to that factor, it's also hard to approximate. Yeah. So because the size of this disk, it has to be at least, let's say, this is distance one. So it will have to be at least one, but I can still do the, the same encoding as long as the disk is just slightly smaller than, has radius just less than two. Okay, so this problem is um, hard to approximate below two, um, but it's very, um, so what you can see is that if, if I look at a slightly different problem, then that actually gives me a true approximation for, for my original problem. And the different pro problem that I'm looking at now is I want to cluster with a reference curve. So what that means is that I'm not now not looking at pairwise distance. So I'm not saying, okay, within a cluster, every pair of trajectories has to be, have 
um, small uh, a distance below d. But now I'm saying um, there should be there should be a curve in this in in this uh, there should be a curve which in my case is q such that everything in the cluster has distance at most d to q. And then using triangle inequality, um, I know that the distance between P and R is at most twice the distance from uh, to, to the center. And that means that if I now find a cluster, instead of finding a cluster where all pairwise distances are small, I'm finding a cluster where the distance to a representative trajectory is small. Then that gives me a true approximation of my original problem. Now, if we look at this in terms of the free space, then it looks like this. So this is now the free space of, let's say I have one trajectory, of this one trajectory against itself. That in particular means that obviously the diagonal will be free, because if I have the same curve with the same parameterization, uh, twice, then I can simply, then it perfectly aligns. But if I now looking for subtrajectories that are similar to um, to other subtrajectories, if, if I think of being here moving along the curve, and I now look at the subtrajectory corresponding to this interval here, then another subtrajectory is similar to a small distance to this one, exactly if there's also a free space here that I can traverse from the lower left, but now lower left relative to that subtrajectory to the upper right. So if I can find this, you could say, this, this set of, of free spaces, then that gives me a clustering with a representative curve. So if, if I can, can find these, these um, these parts in the free space, then that gives me, then I know with distance in the free space with, with, with distance value d, then I know that with 2d I could also do uh, find a clustering with the pairwise distances for let's say those three trajectories and on the other hand if, if there's a cluster with pairwise distances low then obviously I can simply take one of the um, parts as representative and find uh, then these clusters in the free space. So let me show you how this at least schematically look like, looks like in terms of the trajectory itself. So I have this trajectory here. It, um, it's, where does it start actually? I think it starts here. So I, I move a bit. And then this part here corresponds to this here. And then it connect the dots. Then it moves around and at this point again it is close to to this one that we were looking at. So then I get this white part here. It moves out again and in and then I have it a third time and that corresponds to this one here. And the, the way we can now compute this, and conceptually at least that's a, it, it's a fairly simple algorithm, is we're going to sweep the free space from left to right, but we have, have these two sweep lines where um, if possible I extend, so if possible meaning if, if currently I see this cluster, I'm going to extend the, the right sweep line to try to make it longer. Um, and if at some point I don't see a cluster of, uh, of sufficient size anymore, I will going to move this left sweep line. And what we want to make sure that at any event, we want to have uh, M curves from left to right. So I'm moving either, but if I lose this property of having M curves, then I'm going to um, move the left sweep line. I have a kind of slightly bigger visualization of that here. So I have two sweep, sweep lines right now. Um, so M, M is three. I don't have any clusters. So I'm, I'm essentially moving the, the left and right sweep line at the same time. 
still no cluster, there are only two. So at this point, so my left sweep line is here, my right one is just beyond. I, ha I have three curves here, one here, one here, one here. So now I'm going to move the right sweep line and still I have three disjoint curves and now so now if I would move the right sweep line I would this curve would end so now I'm going to start the, to moving the left sweep line again and we start from here uh, and so on yes I would find the three, same cluster three times indeed So the only extra information, so we need to maintain some extra information about, um, so that we can query whether there's still, a, so what we'll do is we, we're going to build a data structure on, on this part here, which we can query if I'm here, whether there's still a path to down there. And in particular, I also need to be able to query how far down I need to go. Because if my path goes down too far, um, let's say, uh, let me take this example here. Uh, is it so if I if my path needs to go down too far or up to here, then it means that here I, can, I will only want to restart slightly below that because otherwise I get these overlapping um, subtrajectories. So I need to in, uh, maintain that information, but at least in, in the let's say discrete Fichet distance setting. This is uh, not too complicated. And the running time that we then get is n squared plus nm. So m was the, number, the, the size of the clusters, l the length, um, and order nl space. Now, I already briefly discussed this issue of if this goes down, where can I restart here? So that is, in terms of the continuous Fichet distance, uh, only kind of additional or the main additional difficulty because it means that if I, if, if I have a if I want to include this curve in my cluster and I have to go down I, I have to go down somewhere onto this arc then I have to carefully see that on this arc I don't start earlier uh, before, before this one ends so I have to start below that and for that, you'll have to look at, at, uh, at a certain envelope of surfaces. So then the running time, so it's essentially the same algorithm, but because of this difficulty, the running time looks a bit more complicated, which just comes from plugging in whatever you get uh, from uh, uh, working with these envelopes. But I don't want to go into more detail here. Um, I'd like to just go back once briefly to, to where we now use this. So that was this map construction um, application. So the way we used it was first to run this on, on various values of epsilon to define uh, to find many, many bundles in, in, in this data set. And then we have this huge set of bundle, bundles. And then based on, on certain kind of properties of the bundles, we select ones uh, which uh, we think is, are important um, and add them to the network and do that uh, incrementally and then when, when we see that, that bundles, that we for instance have bundles that, that um, would merge, then we add an intersection and so on. So I mean the, what we do, do on top of this is actually also quite interesting but not part of the clustering. And then in this example we would get we would reconstruct this network from this original set of trajectories. Are there any questions so far? Because now I'm switching to clustering. No? Good. So for clustering I want to talk I want to show you how we can get an so first of all, I want to discuss how, at least I think, this uh, problem should be modeled uh, for trajectories. Then I'm going to show you an approximation algorithm 
uh, to do center-based clustering on trajectories. I also show you uh, the the hardness. And okay, and then I have a few slides where I talk a little bit about more recent results. Um, and depending on how much time I have, I might kind of go into detail uh, for some of those. But at the very end, I want to bring this back to to also the pigeon application. So the the variant that uh, I mostly want to look at is this KL center clustering. And that means so it is like the K is like in K center clustering or in K means clustering, meaning that I'm looking for K clusters. But we have this additional parameter L, and L uh, tells us how complex the centers may be. So let me take a more schematic view on this. So center-based clustering, um, you know, on, on points, you, I mean, everyone knows k-means. Um, much of this, so not k-means, but k, k center, k-median, you can also do in, in more general metric spaces. So our setting here is not k-means, but k center, which just means that um, I want to find, um, for, for my given set of inputs, I want to find k balls, which um, such that for any of the input points, there's a, a, a center of this ball. So I have a ball with the center, where for any input, uh, the distance to the center is low. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm I want to um, I'm looking, I want to minimize the maximum distance of a point to the corresponding center. So in, in k-means you, you have this, you're minimizing the sum of squares, but here we're doing, we minimize the maximum distance. Now for, in the, if you have points, then the center is simply also a point. And same here, if we have trajectories, then we also want the center to be a trajectory. The problem here is if you, if, if, if you allow the center to be an arbitrary uh, trajectory, then this trajectory could also um, have arbitrary complexity. And maybe I, let me actually draw an example, because I don't have it on the slide. So if if my input, for instance, uh, are trajectories like this, then you can imagine if I want to have a trajectory that is close to all of those, it should be, would be somewhere I start in the middle here. But here, because of this bump up, it would kind of move up here. Uh, it might move down there, move up here. So this could be a center for, if I'm looking at the case of I want to have one cluster for these three trajectories, this could be a potential center of, of a disk in the sense that this has the maximum distance to this red curve over all of the trajectories is low. But you also see that this center picks up essentially any, any little piece of noise that we have in the input. And if you think of clustering as a way of summarizing your data, so of getting a compact representation, then obviously a center where, which, which is more complex uh, than the input trajectories, or in, in this case, let's say, as complex as, as the overall input complexity, is not desirable. And that is a reason for the second parameter <coughs> that we're introducing. That's up here already. Um, the second parameter where I say I have k, so I want to have um, k center trajectories, and they ha should have complexity at most L. Yeah, so k L center clustering, k clusters, but the centers should have complexity L. So uh, an example of a special case, if L is 2, I would be saying, okay, I want to find um, line segments as centers. 
So then in this, if in my example here, k is 1, I'm just looking for one center. If I would say L is 2, then the center that I would be looking for would be something maybe like this. Or if I would say L is 3, I might pick up the, the largest um, outlier here still. So that is KL center clustering. Um, this is an example for L is 2 and K is 1. In particular, K in, in the case of K is 1, this is um, uh, a different uh, geometric problem or a specific version of this problem, and it's a minimum enclosing ball problem. Uh, so if you think of it in, point, in terms of points, if I say, um, it, wait, I should have said K is 1 and L is so minimum enclosing ball um, is not only k is 1, but also L is, let's say, infinity. Then I have the minimum enclosing ball problem, um, which is a problem that is interesting as such. And that is a problem that for points, I mean, finding the, point, the, the minimum enclosing balls for points is, uh, is uh, easy. But here for trajectories, as we'll see, is actually a difficult problem already. Uh, yes? So for K-center, we, uh, we, if K is given and we yes. have the centers of points, there is no ambiguity in the shape of a center. But in terms of trajectory, the shape of a center is, is a problem as well. So if we say L is 3, how will we decide that the, the center, what shape should have? I mean, the trajectory segments, how they are lying? Is it given or we decide, on the, uh, I don't know how, how we decide? I mean, that is something you're optimizing over. I mean, if you say L is 3, you, you know your center may have one bend. Uh, I, I, th I thought that it will only work with the transformation. So with the shape, you optimize on the shape as well. Okay. Yes. Okay, so do we have so, some lines? So in, 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 in another example, if, if I have trajectories like this maybe, and I have trajectories that do if this is my input and I say k is 2 mm -hmm. and L is 3 then what I would like to have will it? No, it will not. What I would like to have is something like this and maybe this. So it's a the shape is part of the optimization. The shape is part of the optimization, yes. Yes. Uh, no, the center is not unique, no. Yes. Mm -hmm. to, so we have not, we can add that to our list of open problems, we have not looked at settings with outliers yet. Uh, we have looked at the setting. Yeah, so I mean we've looked at, at, at uh, the k-median problem where, okay, it is kind of in terms of outliers a bit, bit more resilient because um, you're not doing the maximum but the sum but that we specifically kind of looked at settings where we say okay we also the, some of the, the trajectories may be outliers and we want to do a clustering on the others we haven't looked at yet plenty of open problems yes yes So that's a, it's a good question. Um, that depends on the. That also depends on the distance measure that we're using. So if we have, if if we use a, um, if we are using the Fouché distance, and okay, I have this densely sampled trajectory, and I have another one which is maybe less densely sampled. 
then, I mean, the Fichet distance sees these as polygonal curves. So the sampling, the difference, difference in sampling, I, I think, uh, doesn't matter much here. Because I would still find this, let's say LS3 finds the center. It gets problem. Uh, in, in each of the centers, centers. in the centers. Okay. So L is not um, um, yeah, maybe data point is also a strange name for the, these centers uh, for, for these points because they're not really data. Uh, I also said vertices. Um, but um, so it, this is only about so the center should here for instance have complexity 3. And obviously, I, I'd hope to, in this way, represent trajectories with many more data points. Yes. I thought, I think, uh, so, so part, part of the question can also be related to the, to the distance measure, because if, if I use discrete Fichet distance, then of course it will, I will run into problems in several ways. First of all, the two original ones here are not very similar, because um, for this one I only have those points to map to. But also, when clustering, uh, in particular in the setting of where I restrict L, when I say I, I want to now cluster using discrete Fichet distance or dynamic time warping, um, slightly strange things happen. Because if I here use LS3 and I would want to use this point, that point, this point, it means that all of these blue points in between will have to decide to go through to this and that point. Um, and it gets even stranger with dynamic time warping because, um, let me just show that example. I can, I can run into settings where I have inputs like this. And where my center now, so I would like to have a center that sits here obviously, but with dynamic time warping I end up, might end up with a center which picks a point here picks a point here, picks a point here, because then everything here nicely matches here, everything there match matches there. So with, it, with depending on a distance matter, you have to be careful with sampling. Um, but back to your original question, this L is, we can, we can place them anywhere, so it doesn't need to be on one of the original data points. Good. I'd like to discuss the following results. NP hardness, uh, in particular, it's also hard to uh, approximate uh, in within some factor which is between two and three. Uh, if we just look at the minimum and closing ball problem, then it's hard to approximate uh, within anything smaller than two. And then I also want to show you um, a polynomial time three approximation for this problem. Uh, I will also show you a two approximation for the min minimum and closing ball problem, but that's less interesting as you will see. I will actually start with this and I will start with the minimum and closing ball problem. Um, and this is actually very similar to what we already um, had seen in when we were trying to find clusters. So if this is my input, then um, let's assume C so this was my input. C is now, let's say C is a center for a minimum and closing ball with, and the radius, so the optimum radius that we can get is R star. Then simply by using triangle inequality, if I take any of the input trajectories as center, then, so here I took Q as center, then what we get for any other trajectory, so let's say for P, the distance from P to Q is at most the distance from P to C, and then the distance from C to Q, which together is at most two times the optimum radius. Which means that the minimum and closing ball problem we can very easily approximate in actually an optimal factor of two, um, but algorithmically maybe not the most interesting result. I'm showing this because now we're using the same, we'll be using the same idea, underlying idea, for the more general problem. So the algorithm that we're using is an adaption of uh, Gonzalez algorithm for um, clustering 
for k-center clustering in metric spaces. But we have two differences that we have to deal with here. So for one, um, we do not require the we will not the center will not necessarily be one of the inputs. And even worse, um, the center actually cannot be the inputs, assuming that the inputs have large complexity, because we have to use center curves which have complexity at most n. And the algorithm now proceeds as follows. We pick any of the input uh, curves as, um, as base for the first cluster center. So let's say this is, this is the one we picked, P1. Now P1 is not a suitable um, cluster center yet because it is the complexity might be too high. So we're now going to simplify P1. So we're going to get Q1, that, and that will be our first center. Now, next, we, within the input, we'll, we'll look for the uh, curve which has maximum distance to any of the current center. So that currently is just maximum distance to Q1. And we'll take that as base for the next center. So that, in this case, might be this P2 here, or the large distance here. I'm taking that as a base for the center, so I'm going to simplify P2, getting Q2, um, and so on. And in my case, uh, K is 3, so now I would stop. So this is what my algorithm um, produces. And what I would now like to show is that this is a 3 approximation. Uh, for this, let's have another look at, so we have these PIs. Those were the base for the centers, you could say. And we have the QIs, which are the actual centers that we picked. And if you think of this process of adding one center by, uh, uh, and then the next center and so on, and I look at the radii, the maximum radius of, of, of a cluster that I have during this process, so initially I just have one cluster, um, then uh, during this process the radius decreases um, and in particular it means that um, if I now look at so I have i smaller j so I have look at a, I'm, I'm looking at a center that I already have and I'm looking at one of the future um, one of the future trajectories that I'm going to use as a base then the, the distance here is at least the radius that we had just before we picked this pj. And because these radii are, I, are, um, are decreasing, if I look at, at then the radius at k, so when I'm finished with my cluster, um, this will be even smaller. So that in particular means that these distances qipj are lower bounded by the radius that I end up with. So now, let's everyone see. So what I'm doing now is I add, I'm looking at the, the, the P, at P4 here, and P4 would be the base of the uh, of the next center that I would choose. I mean, my k is three, but now I, I kind of assume let's I do the, the the algorithm just one step further. That gives me this p4 here, and that will be used in the analysis. So if I look at an optimal clustering, then since I now also included p4, so I have one more curve than I have uh, clusters. It means that by pigeonhole principle, one of these pi will have to be uh, two of these pi will have to be in the same cluster. In the, my example here, it's p1 and p4, which are both in this would be both in the cluster of, and this would be one of the optimal centers, q prime. But if we now use triangular inequality, what we get is the radius that our clustering had, which is this RK, uh, so the radius after adding the case center. As we observed up here, it is 
lower bounded by the distance from uh, by, of any qi with pj which I can now split so I can apply this to p1 uh, to q q1 and p4 so then I get this is lower bounded by using tri inequality I plug, plug in q prime so I can go from qi so the qi would be so q1 in our case would have been the zigzag version of p1 I can go from q1 to p1 then I can go from p1 to the center and I can go from the center to p4 now I know so R star is now my, my the cost for the optimal uh, um, clustering that means that since P4 is in the cluster of Q prime this is bounded by R star since PI is in the cluster of Q prime this is bounded by R star um, and since QI was a simplification of PI and if I now assume if I use an optimal simplification then since this is P, QI is a simplification of PI the best simplification for of PI in particular this distance will be at uh, at most the distance between Q prime and PJ uh, no P now I'm switching between Q prime and PI so what I'm saying is that if I have if I had an optimal simplification for P1 Q prime would also be a simplification of P1 but since the one that I used was optimal the distance from P1 to the center will be um, no, the distance from P1 to, to its optimal simplification will be lower than the distance from P1 to the center so that gives me a third R star in this analysis so that's why the quality of the clustering that I computed here or the algorithm computed here is at most three times the optimal so that means we have a three approximation so next I'd like to look at hardness and the reduction here is from shortest common super sequence so uh, we have a set of sequences um, S1 to Sn and they are over a binary alphabet and I now want to compute the shortest sequence such that any of the input sequences is a subsequence and an example would be if this is my input so I have the sequence ABB, BAAA, ABA then a possible shortest sequence super sequence would be ABBAAA of course ABB is included here in the first three letters BAA is included here and ABA is, I can take this A, one of the B's and A here so this is a super sequence of all of three of these and this, is, if it's the shortest then it's the solution to this problem this problem is NP hard and now the idea of the reduction is that we for each of these uh, input sequences we will have um, a curve and then the center that we're looking for will correspond to a super sequence and essentially what we now need if you if you think about this problem so we'll have a, the center that we'll have will be a longer sequence so there will be things on the center not mapped to uh, so one step back if if so I'm encoding these sequences by polygonal curves and essentially what that will mean is that I will have some location where for A and some location for B and depending I will, that the intuition is I want to move from the location from A to the location of B back to the location of A for this one and so on and then the super sequence will move between those locations more often in some way picking up all of these patterns but now obviously the difficulty here is that the super sequence will also include parts which then if I want to map let's say ABA and ABBAAA then the parts in the super sequence that I'm not that I don't want to use those I will have to somehow map to um, other parts of the input that I create so 
And okay, this is one sm uh, uh, slide just about the super sequence. So if 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 at some point I get a center, so let's say um, I have an algorithm that computes a center, and it moves. I'm now in 1D. So I'm looking at 1D. So my my center can actually only move up and down, and I use this third axis just to kind of illustrate time. Um, if it moves down further than, if it moves down below minus one, um, then we interpret that as A, and if it moves above one, we will interpret that as B, and everything else we will want to ignore. And the way we do this in the input sequences, so if, if I have in my input an A, what I'm going to do is I will have one spike down here which will force the center to go down. So this spike enforces that the center somewhere has an A, uh, which means a vertex that is goes, goes uh, sufficiently far down. The center might also have other parts which lie somewhere between um, minus 1 and 1. And to, be, to allow those parts to be ignored when doing the matching between the sequences, uh, the, we encode an A in a sequence by having lots of additional spikes here, which allows any additional um, um, A's or B in the su super sequence to, to be handled by this. Yeah, so the super sequence to pick up this, if my distance is 1, would have to go down at least to here. Now it might also go up and so on. Um, so B will enforce it to go up here. So if I now have a sequence that goes, let's say I have a, my, my, um, my, my input sequence is just A and my super sequence will be A, B for some reason, then it will go down and I will want to go down and up, up to two, up to here here, and maybe there are even many Bs, but all of these Bs I can pick up by these small wiggles that, my, that I include in my A gadget. So I have more examples, let me show those. So this is now the example that we previously had. S1 uh, was ABB, the super sequence that I wanted to have is ABB, uh, that, that, that would work as ABBAAA. Um, so ABB I encode by wiggles down wiggles, B by wiggles up wiggles, and another B by wiggles up and more wiggling. And now I can map A, B, B, A, A, A. So the A I can simply map to this first spike of here. Then the Bs, the two Bs that I need I can map to those two spikes. And then I have these three A's that um, the super sequence uses additionally but those I can simply map to the wiggles that, that are over here. And then similar example, the second one was B, A, A, A. So then um, my super sequence first had an A. I would like to ignore that. I can map it to one of these smaller up and downs. Then I'm going to use uh, map this B to the B and then the rest, then I can map the other B to just one of these small ones and three A's. And this is then the third one. So what we have now is if there is a super sequence of a certain length, then there's a third center curve which consists of at most two T plus one vertices and the other way around if I can find a center curve uh, which has the, 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 uh, pre, uh, the radius 1 in, in the setting, then I can read off the, the super sequence of so the center curve has complexity t, t, 2t plus 1. Um, I can find the super sequence um, of length t. And that means in particular that we can, that we can reduce this uh, shortest common super sequence problem to the, actually the 1L center problem. So we don't even need to use a higher k here, it's just with one. And actually the, um, we can also do the, 
minimum and closing ball, so we can also kind of set this parameter L very high. So this gives us, um, if you again look at these gadgets, you can change, you can, you can vary distance, you can vary your radius to some degree um, up to a factor 2. So that gives us actually a, a 2 approximation. In 2D, in 2D we can do the same construction but somehow use the space more um, effectively or place the gadgets further apart by, by kind of having a 1D space circular here. So the idea again is the same but instead of um, now getting, uh, sh being able to show that we cannot approximate within a factor smaller than 2, we can show uh, something slightly higher than 2. Ideally, if you go back to, to our approximation algorithm, ideally we would like to show that it's not possible to approximate within any factor smaller than 3, but we are not able to do that. So we first thought, um, okay, if we can increase this slightly by going to two dimensions, then we go to 3 and general D dimension, but somehow we are not able to exploit um, um, the higher dimensions. I'm not sure whether that was a, is simply a property of two dimensions or simply a property of um, uh, missing intuition about the higher dimensional cases. I would hope the, the latter. Good. I would like to just show you a, uh, 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 an overview of our most recent results. And for that, I have to briefly uh, introduce one more problem. So we were looking at the KL center problem so far, um, where I um, minimize uh, the radii of the cluster. And now the KL median clustering problem, I'm going to minimize the sum to the corresponding centers. And otherwise, the problem stays the same. So I just put this table in fresh from the paper and fresh meaning that we also just finished it so yesterday <laughs> I updated my slides um, so if you want to read more about it you can either wait for a short amount of time or simply ask me for uh, for the paper so what, what I would like to highlight is uh, so a very interesting question is not simply using uh, Fouché and discrete Fouché distance, but to use dynamic time warping. In particular, in the, so dynamic time warping makes more sense in this median setting. So generally, I mean, you can use, you can combine obviously median and center with, with your favorite distance measure, but dynamic time warping, you're using sums, then that naturally combines with, with a sum um, over the clusters. So there, um, um, we can also show that it's NP-hard, um, but also others um, we very recently showed that it's NP-hard. So here our main improvement is to, essentially by in dynamic time warping, you can choose, if you get, use your, uh, your distance, your, your Euclidean distance, you can choose your exponent, whether you, typically you would use a squared distance, and that is handled or just know the, 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 the regular distance, which is, corresponds to this case here. So this is how, how the exponent, and this means then that I'm going to use the square root. We generalize that to, to arbitrary ways of weighing a, an individual distance. Um, algorithmically, there's not, not many results, and the, the difficulty there really is a missing triangle inequality. So we don't really know how to make progress in that direction right now. Well, but let's see. Um, then what I showed you for the center, essentially much of this with a little bit of extra work um, generalizes to uh, media, to the median problem. And let me also show the second slide in terms of algorithms. Um, so actually the hardware results here are more, I'd say, um, more intricate than the, the algorithmic solutions that we found so far because every all of the algorithms that we have are uh, very much brute force. Yes. 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 
Yes, it's essentially the, the same ideas, just that you have to, yeah, there, uh, you have to do the encoding. You have to first blow up the 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 um, the strings a bit to to make sure that that in terms of weight everything works out. And so there are small changes, but the, I think the main change is that the analysis is more difficult. Yes, so I should wrap up. So uh, these are algorithm, algorithmic results. We can um, say anything. So the three approximation I mentioned. Um, if k and l are seen as constants, then you can um, then you can brute force your way through the problem. Is that actually here on the slide? Um, so we also have an exact. That's actually not on this slide. We also have an exact algorithm, but that has really bad running time. But as you see, uh, so the center problem, you saw the three here. Um, here we started with Gonzalez algorithm, but uh, the, the median problem, obviously, also in metric spaces, has been studied before. So there are algorithms there, which we can base our algorithms on. The, all of the one plus epsilon approximations essentially build on on um, finding first some approximation, let's see, say the, the three approximation, and then placing grids around the, the vertices of the, the, the three approximation, and then testing simply all combinations. Good. So those are the results so far. Let me... I already talked a bit about the pigeons, so let me just show you this one, yes. So here, um, the analysis question that we were looking at is a convergence towards a final route. So, and then we did a, we, we did a clustering, find it main, found main clusters, and then tested whether the final route would fall into essentially the main clusters, and, and they did, so there's kind of some indication that there's actually a final route for the each pigeon. Um, but we also observed that, so another analysis that we tried to do was to see, can we use this to identify pigeons? And that was not possible because some of the pigeons simply used very similar path at the end. Um, this can also be used for visualization. Um, this is just a small example, which, okay, I mean, it just shows a clustering as previously, but this is from, from a, 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 a drawn from a, a database that, that um, has worldwide animal data. And you could imagine that um, to, 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 get to give you a quick summary of, of various data sets, that instead of showing the tracks, you can show, show a clustering for each of the data sets. Let me just put up the slide with open problems. Um, dynamic time warping approximation algorithms, that's a very difficult one. If you are, have a lot of intuition about higher dimensions, then it would be nice to improve this approximation factor. In terms of problems that maybe haven't study, been studied that much yet, so I don't know how difficult the open problems there are, is if we use a weak Fichet distance, but if, if you do that, you have to also check this, the, the work by Harpel and Reiche because they have some positive results. But in terms of lower bounds, uh, um, uh, there's uh, quite a bit open. And also there's this middle curve problem by Hikab Ahn and others. Actually quite a few of recent speakers here, so Carola Wenk is on that paper, and Helmut Alt and Michael Buchin. Uh, they gave um, algorithms for this problem, but this not, did not discuss lower bounds. Um, and that could be kind of an interesting problem to study. Um, they are, well, no, I have to say, I, I guess they're NP hard. So it, it is more in terms of, so they have algorithms where the k, the number of trajectories also show up in the exponent. So, um, I mean, you can think about hardness, but you can also think <coughs> about um, conditional lower bounds where you show, so they have running times of n to the, let's say, some kind of 2k, and then you could try to show that that's a, that a lower bound of n to the 2k, or show a lower bound of n to the k, um, unless some your favorite hypothesis fails. That was more kind of the direction I was thinking of in here. 
it would be hard unless they probably covered. I'm not sure. Good. Thank you. Um, so we had a look at several ones. Um, so you can, so you have the option of using an approximate simplification algorithm, and then your approximation factor simply goes up. So I think you could, for instance, but essentially all of the so so in terms of approximation algorithms, the the, the work that is needed here is is from the Gibbs et al. The um, stabbing disk with lines or line segments paper because the looking at a vertex constraint version here doesn't make I mean vertex constraint here is not good enough if we want to make a claim about optimal cluster centers and in particular local versions uh, will not work here if I want to overall say um, that these are if I want to approximate optimal cluster centers so this is, this is uh, more based on this line stabbing by Gibash snowing and this uh, you probably know. Uh, Uh, I so I actually would have to look into the paper because it was a bit intricate because it's not they didn't exactly show what we needed to have so we still had to put in some extra effort I mean they essentially ha I mean essentially we could yeah so we yeah, yeah we use exactly exactly yeah you answered your question perfect <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, Thank you. What's wrong if you go to the three dimension? You mentioned that you didn't have the semi-contact. So we can just uh, do some of the similar things. I mean, you, you can do similar things in three dimensions. Um, let me go back to the slide here. I, I not in this presentation. I have more slides on this if 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 you want to discuss it further. But the the problem. I mean, the 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 question in terms of our approximation factor is always. Um, so there's kind of this in intended radius, you could say, and then you kind of see how how far, or the tight radius, and then you s you look at how far can you blow up the disks so that the combinatorially nothing changes. So so even with this larger disk, everything still behaves as intended. Um, and our initial idea was to say, okay, we can do this in in 2D like this, and in 3D then we take a tetrahedron. And then the path kind of visits uh, and so on, but somehow in terms of um, in terms of the disks intersection there, it didn't it didn't help in terms of improving. I mean, actually, I think what we got was worse than in the 2D case. It didn't help. Uh, so the disks in intersected in a way that we ran into problems proving anything that works better. The data for the PDIN or the code for tree approximation is available somewhere online? Or um, yes, there is an um, there is an R package um, uh, for with 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 this algorithm and also some kind of heuristics to get try to get better better centers because obviously so uh, I mean I don't know I find this with the three approximation slightly funny in the sense that okay you get a nice clustering but if you now want to use the centers. Um, I mean, the centers are just kind of original trajectory simplified, so it's very obvious that, I mean, let's say in the case of one, of one cluster, yeah. uh, if you go to a biologist and say, okay, I can solve your problem in a three approximation, I'll just take one of your input trajectories, <laughs> they might not be happy. Um, so we have done some heuristics to try to kind of get better centers there. Uh, that's all in an R package. And in that package, there's also, I mean, the pigeon data is also available somewhere else, but we included the pigeon data also that you can kind of get started with. So if you Google it, it, 
I hope you can find it, otherwise you'll ask me. But it, 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 it's on GitHub. The importance of trajectories are different. Um, so I haven't thought about that version yet. I, I, I'd assume that uh, my first step at least would be to look into, again, what is known in metric spaces. Um, that seems like a very natural variant, um, which hopefully somebody already considered, and then take that as a starting point to, to then design algorithm for trajectories. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so for the uh, yeah, in particular for the median setting that would work. Yes, yes. For the center setting, having the tra same trajectory several times will not change the clustering. So then you would, I guess, you would want to. Yeah, but what I what I meant, in and maybe I'm wrong. In the median. Uh, in the median, yes, in the median, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, I completely agree. Yeah, thank you.